Customer relationship management is, to a certain extent, about the analysis of data about customers and then shaping the interactions that the firm has with these customers based on the knowledge you get from this analysis. And since the analysis of large-scale databases and artificial intelligence go hand in hand together, I would like to spend the end of this first session talking about artificial intelligence. The first point that is probably important to mention is that artificial intelligence, which everyone talks about these days, is a far less recent concept than many people believe. Actually, the origins of artificial intelligence go back to the Second World War, where we had two parallel evolutions in the US and in Europe. In the US, we had a professor at MIT called Marvin Minsky, and Mr. Minsky was fascinated by science fiction stories, especially of the writer Isaac Asimov. One of the famous stories of Mr. Asimov is called Runaround, and in this story, Asimov lays out what is called the three laws of robotics. You can Google it, but if you have ever seen a movie where a robot got berserk and wanted to destroy the world, it is usually because at least one of these rules got violated. And this fascination with science fiction and with robotics made Mr. Minsky think about the question, what does it mean to be intelligent and how can machines actually obtain intelligence? And at about the same time, you had another person in Europe called Alan Turing. Mr. Turing was a mathematician who worked with the British government to break a code that was used by the German army to encrypt their messages during the Second World War. This code was essentially impossible to break by humans using manual methods. So what Mr. Turing did is he built on an evolution that had been done in Poland some years earlier and developed the first kind of computer, which was called the bomb. And you see a picture of this on this slide. And this computer was able to do something that humans were not able to do, break the code that was used by the Enigma machine. There's also a very famous movie about this called The Imitation Game, in case you know. And what Mr. Turing then thought is, what does it mean to be intelligent if computers can do something that humans cannot do? This brings us to a point that I come back later again in this session, that is that humans are generally not very good in assessing what it means to be intelligent. As a human, you naturally put certain tasks into a hierarchy. For example, you assume that playing chess is much more complicated than building an Ikea chair or recognizing an element, an, an, an animal as an elephant. And then you assume that if a computer or any other device can do something that you consider as complicated, automatically this device should also be able to do all the things that you consider as less complicated. So if there is a computer that can play chess better than you, you naturally would assume that this computer can also do all the other things that seem for you easier than chess, like recognizing an elephant, and building up an IKEA chain. Now, what Mr. Turing specifically developed is another thing we see back in a couple of minutes, which is called a Turing test, because Mr. Turing wanted to formalize what it means to be intelligent. And the Turing test is as follows. Assume you are a human observer, person C. And person C spends five minutes talking to some entity A and another five minutes talking to some entity B. The person knows that one of these two is a computer and the other is a human. And if after those 10 minutes, the person cannot tell with certainty who the computer was and who the person was. So if there's any kind of doubt between the machine and the human, then you say that the system is artificial intelligence and you call the whole thing the Turing test. Now this Turing test is still the holy grail of artificial intelligence and it has been something researchers focused on tremendously at the early days of AI which was in the 1960s. There was, for example, another professor at MIT called Joseph Weizenbaum who developed a tool called ELISA. You can still find it when you either Google it or uh, you can look at the link on the slide. ELISA was a, a kind of therapist that was based in a chat format. And even if you use ELISA today, it probably takes you 30 seconds to realize that it is a computer generated tool and not a human, but 30 seconds is already a lot when during 30 seconds you doubt whether you're talking to a human or to a machine. Now, the problem with artificial intelligence in its early days was the following. In its early days, researchers tried 
to identify rules that make up certain things and then teach the computer those rules. Take chess as an example. Chess has a certain set of very well-defined rules, how the board looks like, how the play figures look like, and how you can move them. And the idea was to formalize those rules, to put them into a computer, and to assume that if the computer knows all the rules, well, at the end of the day, the computer would also be able to play chess. And this works reasonably well for some basic logic tasks or even for playing chess. But the problem is that many other things in real life cannot be as easily formalized. Think, go back to the example I gave some minutes ago about how you recognize an elephant. Assume you have a little kid and you want to teach this kid what an elephant is. You would not teach that kid rules that identify an elephant. You wouldn't say an elephant is a big animal with gray skin and a large trunk. No, instead you would show that kid probably one or two or three pictures in a picture book of an elephant and that's it. And if you go to a zoo, three months down the road, your kid will remember how an elephant looked like, translate that knowledge from the picture book to real life and recognize an elephant. I'd like you to step back for a second and think of how amazing this is. A very small child takes three pictures in one context, three stylized pictures of an elephant in a picture book, can learn based on this how an elephant looks like and then translate this knowledge months down the road into an entirely different setting and still recognize that animal. Computers are not able to do that nowadays. But what the process is, is that instead of teaching rules, you learn from data. Now, the problem with this in the early days of AI was is that we neither had enough data nor that we have powerful computers powerful enough to learn from this data. However, all of this has changed in the past decade or so with the advent of big data. Nowadays, we have data about everything. If you want 1 million pictures of elephants, no problem, you can find them online. And you call this the world of big data. Big data is usually characterized by three characteristics. There is a lot of data, so there's high volume. There is high velocity, which means the data changes very fast. New data is generated very quickly. Think of the number of videos that are uploaded on YouTube, for example, or the number of pictures posted on Instagram. And high variety. There are different sources. Some is text, some is pictures, some is video. Big data has very fundamentally changed the way how managers do their job. If you had been a marketing manager 20 years ago and you were faced with the decision of, for example, introducing a new product, you will have to take I don't know, let's say 100 decisions during this context. How does the advertising campaign look like? How does the packaging look like? How should the product be priced? How should the product be designed? All sorts of things. However, you would not be able to actually get data for each of these 100 decisions. At the time, the only way to get data would have been to probably rely on panels or more commonly to run a customer survey. But a customer survey might have taken eight to 12 weeks. It might have cost you a couple of $10,000. So out of your 100 decision, you probably were able to do that for one, two or three. But that means you have to take 97 to 99 decisions without any form of data based on your gut feeling. Nowadays, the world is very different because now the challenge is no longer to take data, to take decisions without any data. The challenge is to actually cope with all the data around us. And artificial intelligence is, in its essence, one way of making sense of a lot of big data. So if you want to define artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is the ability to interpret external data, to learn from such data, and to take actions based on those learnings. Think of a smart speaker then you might have at home. Your smart speaker can listen to your voice, the smart speaker has learned what certain words mean, and then the smart speaker can take certain actions. Alexa, switch on the music. Alexa understands, has learned what it means, and then can switch on the music in return. Many people talk about machine learning, which is a branch of statistics, essentially. And machine learning is a very essential part of artificial intelligence because it covers more or less the second step. But Artificial intelligence is more than that because it also includes the ability to perceive data and take actions based on this data. Now, 
There are lots of things that are powered by artificial intelligence these days. The picture recognition algorithm on Facebook, for example, the Alexa, your smart speaker at home, your Tesla car, lots of different things. But let me give you a couple of examples to finish this session. What you see on this slide is the pictures of four people. But the specific characteristic of these four people is that none of them exists. All of these four pictures have been generated by an artificial intelligence algorithm who has learned by analyzing hundreds of thousands of selfies how a human face looks like. So you can very easily generate nowadays at your will an unlimited amount of artificial selfie pictures. You can even use another method which are called talking head models where you make videos out of those faces. In a different context, if you have 10, 20 selfies of people and probably one or two videos, you can use an artificial intelligence software in order to generate a video of that person where that person says whatever you want him or her to say. This opens a whole new world for what is called fake news or deep fake, because you could very easily generate a video in which the president of the United States declares a war to any country in the world. Of course, it's not impossible to see that these videos are fake, but even if it only takes 30 minutes or an hour to realize that, imagine the amount of damage that you can do. Now, let's stay for a second in this area of image processing. One thing that humans usually say when they are faced with artificial intelligence, it is that they say, well, at least something that is creativity will only remain with us. AI may be able to drive a car or recognize some, face, some, some faces on pictures, but a truly creative task AI cannot do. I would like you to look at the images on this slide, pause the video if you want, and identify which one of these you think have been generated by artificial intelligence and which ones you think have been generated by humans. Pick two or three that have been done by AI and probably two or three that have been done by humans. And what you realize is probably that this task is complicated. Not saying it's impossible, but it's far less easy than it might appear because they all look relatively realistic. Now, on the next slide, you see that these are the pictures that have been created by humans. So all the others have been created by AI. If you made a lot of mistake, even if you made only one mistake, this system has just passed the Turing test because you were not able to distinguish what has been done by humans and what has been done by AI. Now, some of you may not be very good with pictures, so let's focus on text. You can pause the video and you can read that text. And this text is a text that has been written entirely by OpenAI, which is a very powerful artificial intelligence solution to create text. And you will see that it is very hard to find out that this text has not been written by a human. Going back to the idea of fake news, imagine what you can do if you pump out fake Twitter messages or fake Facebook status posts using this type of tool. And at the end, I will to focus a little bit on privacy. Many people are nowadays concerned about privacy and rightly so, because the amount of information that you can get out of consumers or out of people in general using artificial intelligence and all the different type of data that is available about them online is amazing. You might have seen very recently a study about um, a, a, a bishop in the US who was outed by a blog post about being gay. What this blog essentially did, and you can Google it to read the entire story, is the following. You can buy what is called app signal data. App signal data is data that tells you for a certain device, for a certain mobile phone, which types of app that mobile phone has used and which location that mobile phone has been at. You don't know the specific mobile phone number. Each of these app signal data, data points has an artificial number. But what is important is the same phone always gets the same artificial number. You can imagine this as like an artificial phone number that sticks with your phone. And you can buy data based on these artificial phone numbers. Now, what this blog did is the following. The blog purchased a whole bunch of this data, identified 
all those mobile phones who use a gay dating app and then try to find the locations of these phones. And they mapped the locations of these phones to the locations where they knew that Bishop had been. And they found out that there is one phone that used the gay dating app that was at the office of that bishop when the bishop was at the office, that was at his home when he was at home, and that was at his vacation home when he was at his vacation home. And although you can never be sure, they said, well, we think this is the bishop and we think he's gay. And it took about eight hours until um, the bishop had to resign. The important point here is that this data can be purchased by more or less anyone. This is not an official government source. This is not some hacker group. This is a Catholic block who purchased this data on the market. And now I'll leave it to your imagination what you can do with this data. And to finish on the last note, one thing, for example, that you can do is an analysis that Uber has done. And I'd like you to look at the date of this slide. This analysis has been done in 2012. So that is about 10 years ago already. What Uber did is the following. Uber identified a rule and said, whenever you have somebody who takes an Uber between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. to a place where they have never been before, and four to six hours later, they take an Uber back to their home from that place, they probably had a hookup. And Uber defined a ride of glory as anyone who takes a ride between 10 and four, and a second ride from within one tenth of a mile of that drop off four to six hour later. And based on this, Uber was able to identify for different cities in the US, New York, San Francisco, the best bars where you can go in order to meet a person for a night. This was at the time already highly controversial and Uber had to pull up this analysis from their webpage very soon, but you can still find it when you Google about it. And that's about it. I hope that this session has given you an introduction what this course is about, what marketing is, what relationship marketing is, what customer relationship management is, and also how artificial intelligence fits onto it. And in the next session, we start to dive in deeper into these topics, specifically focusing on how to assess the value of different customers and different customer groups.